I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest today is Chris Duvos, Managing Director of Venture Investment Associates, a fund that invests a billion dollars in commitments to venture capital funds. Chris is responsible for the management of relationships with the fund's managers and the identification and development of new manager relationships. He is the author of an entertaining blog about venture capital entitled Super LP Adventures in Investing, available at superlp.com. Prior to joining VIA, Chris spent seven years co-heading the private equity program at the Investment Fund for Foundations, or TIFF. In this role, he was responsible for another billion dollars in new capital commitments. Before joining TIFF, Chris worked on Princeton University's endowment team. He started his career as a strategy consultant at the Monitor Company. Chris is a graduate of Yale University and the Yale School of Management. Our conversation starts with Chris's path to venture capital through strategy consulting, investment banking, and an endowment investment office. We talk about perception and reality in venture investing, exciting areas of future innovation, and the nuts and bolts of research, portfolio construction, and decision-making when running a portfolio of venture funds. When Chris pulls off his suit, the red undershirt of the Super LP remains. He's a charismatic guy with great insight into how the venture game is played and draws many parallels from venture to investing in general. I thoroughly enjoyed listening and learning from Chris, and I hope you enjoy the show. And if you do, this week, why not reach out to that friend of yours? You know the one I'm talking about. There's someone you've known forever and trust and love so much. You probably only see each other maybe every year or two these days, but whenever you get together, it's like no time had passed at all. Go ahead, reach out to them and just say hi. When it comes up what inspired you to reach out, just tell them you thought of them while listening to the Capital Allocators podcast. And maybe they want to have a listen too. Thanks so much for spreading the word. Please enjoy my conversation with Chris Duvos. Chris. Ted, how <laughs> so, are you, my man? Oh, good. So good to be here with you. Thanks for Likewise. joining me. So this is going to be our first podcast really talking about a subsector of the broad investment landscape, venture capital. But let's just get started with how you ever got into this stuff in the first place. Well, before we get started, can I apologize to you? I have an apology that's 26 years in the making. In the <laughs> spring of 1991, you were the captain of our co-ed softball team. I was a pitcher. You were a second baseman. That's right. I, that's right. And we had a swank team. I mean, it, that was a quality squad. And if you recall, we went to the championships and we were playing Berkeley. And I remember we were down one run in the bottom of the last inning. And I came up and runners on second and third. And here I was, I was this hitter. I was supposed to, I was a player. Like I had played baseball in high school and everything. And I remember you were coaching first base. And I remember Berkeley had this shift on. And so I thought, oh, I'm going to be clever. I'm going to like Smoke a liner out to like right center field. Hey, score the, was two Theo Epstein in Berkeley? He went because I was just wondering if he it, put the shift. I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> that would be really funny. Theo outsmarting us back then, even. Anyhow, so here I was. I'm trying so hard just to smack a ball to the opposite field, and I get this pitch, just fat, fat pitch, and I swing as hard as I can, and I just get right under it, and I hit this weak pop out to the second baseman for the third out. And we lost on that. I was the last out, and you just looked so crestfallen at first base because <laughs> we weren't the, the intramural champions. And the only, like, aside from bragging rights, you got these really swank shirts. And all I wanted was one of these shirts. I only got one of those shirts in my time in, in college. And that was my second chance for one. And, and so I'm sorry. I'm sorry oh, I flied out weekly to the second Chris, base. Chris, I accept your apology. <laughs> uh, th that was a team effort, and fortunately, I've long since forgotten, though I do remember that team because we, we did have a good team, and oh, it was, was a, a lot of fun. Squad. So yes, we met at undergrad. We had, we did indeed. <laughs> and what the heck did you do after that? Well, after so, that uh, difficult uh, yeah. <laughs> intramural softball <laughs> loss. 
<laughs> well, that was that was good fun. So yeah, so we were in college together, and then actually one thing that's funny is you went off to the Yale Investments office, and you said to me, you said, you know, you should come talk to these guys. And I said, you know, I don't want to be in New Haven. I want to be in Boston or New York. The dumbest thought I've ever had in all my life because what an amazing time that was to be to be at Yale and to be with those guys and, and to really be, you know, kind of pioneering portfolio management, as it were. And yeah, but, but I went off, worked on a congressional campaign in that 94 election after graduation, and that was just a bunch of shenanigans and, and you know, kind of rub, you know, sandblasted any idealism I might have had away and then went to work in in strategy consulting so that was a great time I worked at monitor company up in Boston Michael Porter's firm and I'll tell a, a Porter story in a little bit but what was funny is in 99 I decided to go to business school cuz I didn't know what was going on and companies you know we were working for a bunch of companies and they were all stressed out about how companies were getting valued on eyeballs and I didn't know like is every user one eyeball or two like how do you what is this metric <laughs> I'm off by like you know a factor of two either way so there I was I was like really confused but in, meanwhile there was this guy David Fialco who's now uh, who was one of the founders of a venture firm General Capital Catalyst. And Fialco is this like wild man. He's the most amazing, engaging guy. And he's got this kind of crazy Einstein hair. And he's like super in your face all the time. And it's amazing. He's, he's a force of nature. And I was talking to him about joining one of his companies potentially and, and had interviewed and he wanted me to join. And I said, I really need to go to business school because I need to figure out this eyeballs thing and actually learn something. And he goes, what? What? Duvos, it's 1999. Going to business school now is like studying geology during the gold rush. You're crazy. Get out of the classroom. Get out in the, get, you know, get into the field. What's the matter with you? Well, you know, I, I take no satisfaction in the fact that that company was bust in, in 18 months, <laughs> but it would have been an amazing experience. And I, you know, I would have ended up probably going to work at, at General Catalyst and life would have been you know, radically different. But instead I went to business school. And had this, uh, my business school summer was uh, doing investment banking at Morgan Stanley, and that was an oppressive experience. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so I got back to Yale and actually hung out with a guy who had been a year behind me, two year, three years behind you, um, Seth Alexander, who's now the CIO at MIT. And I was talking to Seth about how miserable I'd been at Morgan Stanley, and he said, dude, it's because you were an agent and you've got a principal's mentality. And he's like, you should, you know, you should think about endowment management. He said, you know, it's it's the most amazing job. It's like the closest you'll ever come to managing your own multi billion dollar dollar fortune. You have incredible flexibility, uh, low liquidity needs, long if not infinite time horizon, few tax headaches, a single client, et cetera, et cetera. This is amazing stuff. I said, wow, this sounds really amazing. Can I come work at the Yale Investments Office? He says, well, no, because um, <laughs> we we like to hire out of undergrad like we did with Ted and me and Tim Sullivan and all these amazing guys. And so uh, so he said, go talk to Princeton. They, they're looking to hire somebody. And I said, cool. And he said, and when you go to Princeton, talk about timber. And so I learned everything I could about timber. This is 2001. And I showed up at Princeton and I probably spent three of my five hours of interviews talking about timber and got the job, right? And I, oh my God, to this day, I can tell you all about timber, which for a kid from Brooklyn where we have one tree, like, right? I mean, this is, you know, I always think like, you know, it's amazing. Like a tree grows in Brooklyn. We got one tree over there. Just to circle back, there's some contrarian thoughts coming into my head, right? In 1999, at the height of the internet bubble, you went to business school. Right. In 2001, when everything had started to shift, and you're talking about trees. Yeah. Well, so, you know, it's interesting because growing up in Brooklyn, you got to work harder. You got to be a lot smarter. You got to be a self-starter, all that, you know, all that good Hamilton <laughs> stuff. And, you know, I, f I learned early on that I couldn't play the game, you know, that other people were playing. And, uh, and so I always, I always had this kind of, you know, how do we turn the cube on its side question, right? How do we get a, a different, a different angle? And then there was this like amazing moment I had and I, let me take a little detour because this is one of my, one of my favorite stories. So when I was at monitor, my office mate was this amazing woman, Jody, and she had been president of the Harvard womanist house. And they were, you know, they were W-M-Y-N. They weren't woe men. They were women, right? I, I can respect that. She was just really amazing and, and, and very kind of passionate about gender equality and good for her, ahead of her time. And one of her big issues was co-ed bathrooms, right? Like she was always pushing for co-ed bathrooms. And, um, <laughs> Why was she pushing for co-ed bathrooms? Because she was like, you cannot believe how much networking goes on in the men's room. I'm like, I know exactly how much networking goes on. You go in, you do your business, you get out. Boom. Nobody wants to like jibber jabber while you're, you know, you're in there. Um, she's like, no, 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 you don't understand. You have no idea. So it's Jody's last day. 
And uh, and here I am. I'm a big spender. I'm going to take her across to the Cambridge side gallery and buy her lunch at Aubonpain to you know to, to to thank her for being my my roommate before she my office mate before she goes off to law school last day, you know celebrate Jody, and we go to the bathroom before you know stop in the hallway, and she turns right to go to the ladies' room. I turn left to go in the men's room, and I walk into the men's room and there's Mike Porter who was, you know, the kind of spectral, ephemeral presence at Monitor. Like, nobody ever saw him except, like, during the speech. He, you know, he's one of the firm's founders. And, you know, he'd give the speech at, at Global Orientation, and then you'd never saw him again. And, oh, my gosh, I'm at the urinal right next to him. And I'm like, oh, I now I'm going to have an idea of how much networking goes on in the men's room. So I go, hey, Mike, you playing a lot of golf? Because I knew he was an All-American in golf at Princeton. And he goes... Funny that you say that. I was just thinking the other day that I should clean off my clubs. Ha, ha, ha. And we had a little jibber-jabber, and there we go. We'd finish our business. We're washing our hands. I go, hey, Mike, I'm going to head off to business school in the fall. What advice do you have to me for me? And he goes, you know, here's your plastics moment, kid. Railroads. I'm like, railroads? He goes, yes, railroads. He's like, all of my students at the business school are into technology, media, telecom, startups, venture capital, banking, consulting. Nobody's going into railroads. He goes, a young, charismatic, putatively smart guy like you, you should be able to get into railroads. You'll be CEO of Burlington Northern within 15 years and watch Warren Buffett will buy it. And I go, oh. he literally said that. He literally said that. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Like the, the foresight. I mean, this, yeah, this is amazing, right? And so we're kind of laughing about that. I go, all right, railroads, plastics, railroads. I got it. And we're walking out of the bathroom. And just as we're walking out of the bathroom, Jody's standing there. And we're walking out. And Mike looks at me and goes, hey, kid, how about we play golf this weekend? It would be really fun to get the sticks out, and this is super pleasant. We can we can go out there and talk some more. <laughs> Call my assistant, and he like pats me on the back and walks off. Jody's face turned red; <laughs> steam was coming out of her ears. It was just amazing. I the whole lunch I heard about. Now I will tell you, I didn't call him to play golf. <laughs> nor did I go into railroads. I went into investing, but I got a great story out of it. But the essence of the story is that, it, it, you know, Yogi Berra said it, the, the famous Yankee philosopher said, you know, you got to hit them where they ain't. And that's, that's been an animator of my, uh, of my investing history throughout. Awesome. So let's go back. You're, you're at Princeton. Mm-hmm. Focusing on timber, or were you? No, there are smarter people than me. John Erickson was working on timber and uh, and real assets and stuff. So I was working. I spent half my time in hedge funds and half my time in private equity. And I remember in the in February of two thousand two, I went out to California, and I was driving down two eighty, which is a scenic road. And I started thinking about some Walt. I took a Walt Whitman class at Yale, and there's this great poem, "Song of the Redwood Tree." And it says, you know, this was written in 1858. It says, California, a flashing and golden pageant, populous cities and the latest inventions, with many a thrifty farm and steamers and the latest machinery with diggings of wool, wheat, the grape, and yellow gold. And I always thought about that, populous cities and the latest invention. And here we were, I showed up at this meeting, and I'm sitting in this meeting in 2002, and we're talking about all of the stuff that's going on in technology and innovation. And there, that poem ends with Whitman talking about, he says, I see the genius of the modern, the child of the real and the ideal, forging a nation so grand, heir to a past so grand to forge a new America. And I thought like, holy smokes, like I'm like in the epicenter of this like utopian ideal. And I got back to Princeton. I said, you know, in hedge funds, with all due respect, it feels like we're just fighting over how big our slice of a pie is going to be, whereas in private equity and venture especially, it feels like we're growing the pie. And I said, this is where I want to focus. I spent the rest of my time at Princeton uh, focusing on private equity with a bias towards venture, and it was amazing. In your time at Princeton, you started with this idea of, hey, this is like managing your own billions of dollars, long time horizon, the team. What resonated there? And what was different from what you thought going in? So that's a, that's a really important question because one thing that Andy Golden, our CIO, said that was really important, he said that all of the risk premia have been arbitraged away except for one. He said Horizon. People just need cash sooner. And by being a long-term liquidity provider, you know, if we can be, he, I think his phrase is BLT investor, if we can be a beyond-the-long-term investor, 
then we can capture some risk premia, like durable risk premia. I was like, whoa, that's actually really interesting. And venture capital is like the perfectly suited asset class for that. David Salem, uh, you know, our, our founder at when I was at TIFF, always did a survey and he asked, P, you know, asked CIOs of you know, the top 100 uh, endowments and foundations, if you could start your career today, like what size pool of assets would you ideally want to start with? The answer is always four or five billion dollars because people felt like they were Goldilocks size, right? But you look at kind of what Princeton and Yale and you know Northwestern's ten billion dollars, Stanford's twenty billion dollars. You know these guys continue to put up great numbers at very large sizes. And we always thought size was the enemy of performance. It's actually one of the reasons why I left Princeton, kind of in retrospect, probably foolishly so. So what was that decision process? Because you were you were in a great environment doing what you wanted to do in venture capital. How long were you there? Three years to the day. And then, this was actually amazing because I had set a rule. You know, Herodotus was not only the first historian, but I call him the first investor because he would go around and you know you read the the histories by Herodotus, and he says, and then I was in the land of the Lydians, and these are the stories that the Lydians told, and then I was in the land of the Achaeans, and the, you know, blah blah. It's like, and I'm like, you know, I need to be in the land of the Startupians, and so I made this rule, you know, because the way most people do diligence is they run up and down Sand Hill Road and they say, hey, Mike Moritz, who's good today? Hey, John Doerr, who's good today? And you're just getting this warmed over conventional wisdom with sometimes a, a healthy you know dose of politics on the side. What I thought was like, you know, I was a history major in college, right? You know, besides good cocktail party conversation, a relatively impractical major. What'd you study? I was economics and political science, which Dave Swenson asked me in my interview, EPS. Doesn't that stand for easiest possible studies? (laughs) (laughs) And at the time it was. (laughs) (laughs) That's hilarious. So I was going out to California with some frequency and I made this rule for myself. I said, you know, our being a history major, like we've prized primary sources and the primary sources were the entrepreneurs. I started going out and just cold calling entrepreneurs and people, you you show up, you talk about their business and they, you know, people are thrilled to talk about what they're up to and then you can get all kinds of really good insights. And so in kind of 2002, 2003, I started that for every hour I spent with a, with a venture capitalist, I'd spend an hour with an entrepreneur. And I started finding out these really interesting things, like what we today call lean startup. People were just starting to get hip to then. And I was like, whoa, I'm like on the front edge, you know, of of a really interesting kind of wave, the bleeding edge. And if this is true, then our whole venture portfolio is wrong footed. That's not entirely true. You know, like any blanket statement like that generally isn't true. But but I, I believed it to be actually like pretty true. And the more I thought about this stuff, the more I thought, wow, I got to do something different. Meanwhile, kind of in late 2003, David Salem at TIFF reached out to me and he said, you know, we're looking for somebody to help co-head our private equity effort. And I've heard great things about you. And I'm like, oh, my marketing dollars are well spent. But I sat down with David and started talking to him about what I was seeing and about how I thought there was an opportunity. David's got this amazing, you know, kind of magnetic personality. He's like, you know, I hear the Clintons are like this. Like when you're talking to me, you feel like the only person in the world. And I was telling him about all the like elements of lean startup. And Dave just started, David just started looking at me and going, yes, 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 Chris, yes. Like nodding his head. And you, I felt like I had stumbled on the most eternal truth. I had goosebumps. And he was like, Chris, I want you to come on board. And I want you to invest courageously. I want you to do some heroic investing. I was like, whoa, you've got me. Like, That's you've awesome. got me at hello, right? And so I was like, I came on board and it took me about a year to get my sea legs there and like to really kind of formulate some hypotheses. And then kind of 2005, six, seven were like really productive years in terms of finding some stuff that was really different then. Today is actually kind of a little bit overrun. Let's take a, a detour to the whole notion of portfolio construction. Ah. Because I I really like the way you phrase it. Yeah, there's a degree to which in the public markets and certainly in hedge funds, there are people are looking for inefficiencies and you say the venture world, this is growing the next great business. So if you were tasked with having, hey, you've got billions of dollars of your own money, knowing what you know today, what what would you do? Ah, well, so that's a really interesting question. That's a, a very long answer. I'll probably give the shortest answer. You know, everybody who knows who's ever done any modern portfolio theory knows about the optimizer and you got this, you know, you got on one axis you got expected return, on the other axis you have you have risk, which is measured by volatility. Now, there's a whole riff I can go on about how that completely is a misspecified measure of of risk 
even in public stuff, but especially in private stuff, not only with stale prices, but like when I think about the startups that I invest in, not only do we have like product market fit risk, technology risk, execution risk, but we have like, did Bob, the VP of sales, sleep with Jane, the wife of, you know, Bill, the VP of engineering, and they're both going to quit on the same day there's and the company's going to zero. involved. I there's actually like, it's amazing how like, intimate the risks are, right? And I make light of it, but like these are, you know, does the VP of sales have a bad month? And, you know, the, the company is, these are that fragile. And so, you know, the optimizer is kind of silly. And so, you know, but you put on, you say, okay, well, we think that domestic equity has this real return and this volatility and then this correlation. And then you plug all the stuff in, you, you know, this stuff intimately. And venture always ends up on the frontier. Like you draw, end up drawing this curve of what the optimal portfolios are. Venture always ends up on the frontier. Venture has been this interesting asset class because it's it's so like mythologized, right? The secret sauce at Yale for many years, I mean, Yale does so many things so well, but one of the key secret sauces has been venture capital. But really, so people have kind of come to the asset class with this like almost lottery ticket like mentality, right? And in fact, we use lottery slogans with Ivy League veneer. So you got to be in it to win it means, you know, optionality. Hey, you never know means, you know, asymmetric payoff, right? And we've kind of created this whole kind of mythology around how you make money in venture, very little of which is true. And outside of the 415, 650, and 408 area codes, you know, there's this perception of venture, which actually isn't true. There's amazing stuff that goes on. There's amazing innovation. But the investment in that innovation is a really, really tricky thing. Now, to your question of, you know, how I'd invest, Mr. McCants, Henry McCants from Greylock, and I call him Mr. McCants the way Derek Jeter calls Joe Torrey Mr. Torrey. Mr. McCants once said to me in 2002, reflecting back on the bubble, he said, when venture's working really well, time is really cheap and capital is really expensive. He says, what happens in bubbles is that time becomes really scarce and expensive. People don't have any time. And as a result, their capital becomes cheap. And when you have that kind of a relationship, watch out. And it's really interesting to watch kind of people's perceptions of time as a proxy for, you know, how much energy they can devote towards actually improving things and making it making an impact. This is the fundamental equation of any asset class that doesn't hold in venture. I call it Buffett's equation. It's only because I've totally, totally assigned it to him. I don't know if he ever said it, but opportunity equals value minus perception. So as perception gets large, opportunity shrinks. What's amazing in venture is that perception and value is actually almost this, in this like recursive loop. Why is Snapchat a $25 billion company? Because people think it's worth $25 billion, right? That's surreal. That's surreal. And so like in, in the three area codes I mentioned, 415, 650, 408, we live in this vortex where perception actually drives value. Now, the reality is that you have to get liquid somehow, right? So either you sell to somebody who may or may not buy into the vortex, or you have to sell to the public market. And in the public market, that's where that relationship should break down. So right now, Snap, I, you know, I hate trash talking Snap, but you know, it's out in the public markets and I'm just like, I'm like stunned that it's as highly valued as it's stunned. And I'm like waiting, like what is the market failure here? Like why is that company worth what it's worth and, and what have you? And so it was interesting kind of sitting in the lobby, I was, there was a little thing on the, on the Bloomberg ticker that said, you know, short sellers to target startups going public. And, and while, you know, that's my, that's, you know, notionally bad for me, I'm like, it's about friggin' time. Let's return some kind of rationality in the public markets and the acquisition markets to return rationality into the private markets. Yeah. So, so I mean, this dynamic is kind of similar to what, you know, I remember from the late 90s and early 2000s. And you have this interesting game theory, where if you're a venture capitalist and you know that the, the exit of the public markets are valuing things high, you might be a little bit less sensitive to your entry price because if you can turn things fast enough and time gets short, you can get out. If you don't do it, your neighboring venture capital firm might. And if they get out in time, you know, the returns are high enough. I remember having this exact conversation back then with a friend of mine saying, look, it's rational that venture capitalists should pay more for deals because – there's yes, we're all trying to generate absolute returns, but there's also, like everything else, a relative performance aspect to it. So how do you think about that? Let's just go right to today's market. 
in normal markets, there's almost like a U-shaped opportunity curve. And with, I guess, the x-axis being stage of investment. So I think that the earliest stages tend to be most interesting because that's where risk is highest. And if you can, if you can mitigate and get paid for those risks, you can you know find interesting companies and you know make them better and et cetera, et cetera. I think there's a lot of potential return, and historically that's been shown to be true. You know that raw innovation is the stuff that really gets me jazzed. Then I think you get to the mid stage where you tend to have more price fluctuations and you know nature and capital markets both abhor a vacuum. And so when there's real opportunity in the mid stage, you know, later stage folks will come in and price things up. And so people say, are there better risk adjusted returns in the mid stage? I go, I don't know how you risk adjust venture. The risks are so high as to be almost infinite. So you can't risk adjust it. You can maybe time adjust it slash duration adjust it, but that's nothing. And then I think at the other end, you know, you have high opportunity in the late stage if you've got the timing right. Right? And so that tends to be more of a beta market. And there's some people who have been able to be like, have like systemically asymmetric beta in their favor, right? There's some firms that are just good at that over cycles even, but they tend, you know, they tend to be, you know, when the market stops, you know, left holding the bag. And that's my like history is having joined Princeton in 01, we were dealing with the wreckage of a lot of people who had been left holding those bags. From my perspective, I've always, I've always been a super early stage investor. The downside of that is that the holding periods are really, really long. So it helps that I've got investors of my own that have extremely long time horizons. They're all endowments and foundations. And so they're willing to get compensated for that, you know, that time. The other thing I'll say is that even now the early stage feels crowded. There's a lot of chaos capital and we've seen crowdfunding come into the market. So I'm actually going yet earlier. I'm spending a lot of time literally running around college campuses, not like I'm going to find the entrepreneurs, but find like vectors into entrepreneurial seams. And college campuses are amazingly entrepreneurial hotbeds. You know, everybody wants to be Stan- Stanford. Um, by the way, if I could short Stanford, I would. It's, it's a fantastic place, but talk about perception, you know, kind of all those entrepreneurs coming out of there that are so have very full perceptions of themselves. But there are other campuses that I've gone to that are producing kind of comparable talent and comparable ideas with much more humility. So I'm really curious how in your seat, so you're running around college campuses looking for people, ideas, but ultimately you also need a bridge in between you and the venture capitalist who's going to fund those people or those ideas. So what are you, what are you running around doing? You know, so it's, it's a really interesting question. So, um, And this is one thing I learned from Yale, right? Like Yale was unafraid to put people in business. And so I think back to some elements of of my own history where I've been most successful is kind of finding people who are doing really interesting stuff and, and capitalizing them. So there are a couple of initiatives I've got going on right now where it's people who are focused on kind of university spin outs and maybe in some different areas like things like material sciences or or hardware, where I found people who who are managers who will engage with people on these, you know, these kind of campus environments in a much more thoughtful way than I could. But it's important for me to be there and be on campus and and kind of really get a, a sense for the zeitgeist. Which, by the way, I was at a school. I was talking to this this kid who's got this amazing device. And he's like, oh, yeah, well, I, w- I was like, when did you start working on this? He's like, well, I was president of the medical device club. I mean, I, as I recall, when we were in college, like, <laughs> we had like the beer drinking club and the whiskey drinking club and the scotch drinking club. And, you know, might have missed the medical device club. There is a notion of investors and in venture capital that it's a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy that everyone seems to know who the best venture firms are. They generate the best returns. The entrepreneurs want their money more than others. And so if it was an efficient market and the, and the venture capitalists all knew who the best companies were likely to be, there's only a small number of them that get to back them. Is that true, number one? And number two, what was that model? You, you sort of touched on this lean yeah. model. Like, What was that model that was different from the, hey, you, you have to be with the best or you shouldn't play at all? Right, right, right. You know, so it's interesting because, you know, when it comes to this question of, you know, you have to be with the best or, or don't play at all, I often think venture capital is like Congress. Everybody hates Congress but loves their congressperson. And so everybody, like, if, if I ask 50 LPs to give me the top 10 venture firms, the top four or five will be on everybody's list, maybe in different, you know, places. And who are those top four or five? To, just generally. Well, so you're list. talking about, you know, kind of Sequoia, Benchmark, Greylock, 
you know, Kleiner Perkins, but, you know, here, and, and I don't, you know, I don't mean to, you know, kind of trash talk anybody, but, but ultimately when you, you're talking about venture capitalists, they're capitalists, right? And, you know, those are all great firms that I just mentioned, but being capitalists, people understand the laws of supply and demand, right? And when there's more demand than there is supply, you know, price goes up. And so, you know, you see a lot of value capture by these, by these funds. So they're taking higher and higher incentive fees, right? This is a endemic to all of finance and they're growing larger and larger right so i just saw the other day like today in the wire you know sequoia has closed on four billion dollars four billion dollar fund four billion a series of funds so they've got the 500 million dollar early stage two billion dollar growth fund a fund in china you know so it's actually like a lot of money now i'm sure those guys will make money but the problem is is this is what i call the steven bochco effect so the tv producer bochco did some really edgy, you know, artsy stuff, right? You know, Hill Street Blues, NYPD Blue, all these things. And so, you know, his characters would, you know, either swear or be, you know, show their butt, you know, on TV or whatever, you know, all in all in the service of art. It was authentic and gritty and real and and like boundary pushing, but appropriately so in the in the service of art. And then what happens is once that taboo is broken, then you get like Temptation Island and naked people and kind of frolicking on reality TV, right? So what happens is so Sequoia goes out and raises four billion dollars, and then you know Billy Bob Joe's venture firm thinks they can raise four billion dollars. And by the way, there's a lot of money coming to the asset class that, that they can. So, you know, this kind of value capture, I think, has fundamentally changed, you know, except for Benchmark, which has stayed small, kind of to their great credit, you know, a lot of these firms have grown so large as to make the arithmetic difficult. You know, I I always would do this math, and this is one of the things that made me think about small funds, right? If you've got a $500 million venture fund to return three times that money, which is what we expect from venture because the risk is so high, they have to return a billion and a half dollars to their investors for having taken down $500 million. But the reality is they don't own very large stakes at exit. So you look at Google, right? Kleiner and Sequoia each owned 10%. Or you look at, I'll give a company that just uh, filed to go public, Blue Apron, right? The meal, meal kit service, which is a fantastic service. First round capital owns 10%. Bessemer owns, I think, 20%. So if you look at the ownership for a firm that owns on average 10% at exit, they've got to return $15, $15 billion dollars. They've got to create $15 billion in enterprise value to get a billion and a half in returns, right? For a $500 million fund, we're seeing $700 million funds, $800 million funds. So there are levers you can pull. You can own more, right? You can invest earlier. There, there's some levers you can pull. But the reality of it is like, it's, t- it's really, really tough to generate venture returns on large funds. So like I said, those funds will continue to do well, but some of the venture funds that we've seen grow quite large end up doing much better for their partners than they do for their investors. Yeah, well, that's pretty common across all of asset management, right? Right. So the model you embraced then was, was different from let's just go partner with the best guys. Yeah, and, so, and actually, so you asked a question which I, I didn't answer, but the answer becomes really important. There's always been this conventional wisdom that you invest with, you know, the the top 10 name brands. Cambridge Associates did a study, and they looked at post-2000 venture funds. The cohort of top 10 funds in each vintage year, typically more than half were funds with a Roman numeral lower than Roman numeral three. Meaning it was the third fund from that firm. That's right. Yeah. If that's true, right, and, and I've always had this hypothesis that fund three is like the optimal fund. It's where, you know, hunger and experience intersect. I've invested in a lot of fund ones, and these guys make all kinds of mistakes, right? It, sure. it, it ends up being really labor intensive for me, which I actually really enjoy because I enjoy helping managers kind of find, you know, being, being kind of a mentor and a conciliary to, to, these, to these managers. But the reality of it is it's people are always like learning on your dime in fund one, right? But by the time you get to fund three, they've learned a lot of lessons, but they're still really hungry. And that's where they make real, and they're usually right size. So it's an amazing and fruitful place as opposed to fund 10 or 11 where you have, in, in some cases, generational transitions or partners who have called in rich or, you know, kind of all kinds of retired on the job, whatever you have. It's funky. But so there's this real opportunity in kind of newer funds. So getting back to 2005, 2006, what had happened between 1998 and 2005 was, you know, between virtualized infrastructure, you could now rent stuff, you know, if you had a credit card and an Amazon Web Services account, you could start a company, right? A lot of stuff was open source, you could offshore some of your coding. 
you could because you could rent infrastructure instead of buy you could do testing on a real time basis right hypothesis time uh, hypothesis testing real time and you could build in response to demand not in advance of demand so so much money was wasted in the late 90s because people had an idea and they spent 10 million dollars on infrastructure and the idea was crap and all these servers you know yeah. right so my friend Josh Koppelman had this this realization that the first company started in 1993. It took him $7 million to get to first revenue. His next company is started in 1998, took him 700 k Today, I would say that the you know to get to first revenue is the opportunity cost of unemployment. Basically, that's your cost. But that's really interesting. You know, the, the corollary to that though is the barrier century have come way, way down, which is which is a whole nother thing. But that said, at the time, nobody really got this. So there's this huge capital gap where there are these companies that were starting and didn't need that much money to get off the ground. But venture firms were coming to them and saying, oh, we'll do, uh, you know, we'll do an A round with you know, an $8 million check on, on $8 million pre. These guys are like, we don't need that much money. We don't need that much dilution. We don't, you know. So there, the capital gap was a really important thing. And there was a generation of funds. So first round and true were some of the really OATV not long after that, guys like Maples, which is now Floodgate and, and SoftTech and, and Baseline, these pioneers really figured this out. And there were like 15 or 20 firms that figured this out. Today, by the way, there are about 350 firms in this space trying to do this. And I think like 80% of them have an institutional backer, which is mind boggling to me. But at the time, it was like totally open field running. And these guys could, with very little money, you know, validate, disprove, or de-risk an entrepreneur's hypothesis. And then you had this huge value inflection. It could help set the portfolio company's DNA. It was like working in a lab, like a startup lab. And it was amazing. Like, I'm getting chills just thinking about it. And there was this golden era from, like, 2005 through, like, 2010 or 11. And a lot of great companies kind of came out of this time. You know, you look at, like, Uber and Fitbit and you know, some of these great companies that were, like, you know, kind of tinkered ideas. So one of the things is I've always been fascinated by venture capitalists. I remember this in my early years in the business. Business, they're like the eternal optimists. So we're sitting here in New York and financial markets, active management's been underperforming. Everyone is sort of pessimistic. There was always, you know, to Michael Lewis's phrase, the new, new thing, right? Palm based computing. And then it was the internet and the cloud and personalized healthcare. So as you look in your portfolio of, of the new companies getting formed today, what is the new, new thing? Oh my gosh. I almost think think of it in a thematic way. And here's how I think about it. A friend of mine says that hardware is getting soft and software is getting hard. And what we mean by that is that, you know, hardware is basically commodity, commoditized, right? And software is is everywhere. That's that's driving, you know, driving it. You, the, the hardware in a phone is getting cheaper and cheaper, but it's a software where the value really resides and allows you to do kind of many things. And software is getting hard. Like, I, you know, we're sitting here, we're looking out at, at Midtown Manhattan, and it's, you know, kind of a dark day because it's a little bit drizzly, which is very foreign to me being from California, a sunny and magical land. But, you know, we've got startups that are working on, you know, kind of reactive glass that kind of tints, you know, with, with, the, with the brightness. Somebody once said life is code, right? DNA, the AGTC sequence, right? Like that's just code. And we it's amazing the amount, the advances in computational biology, right? There's this, there's this melding that's really kind of portending this amazing future, right? And I think about some of the portfolio companies we've got. We've got, you know, kind of some interesting stuff going on in soft robotics, right? Like right now, robots can hurt you. Like they don't really feel that well, uh, or, you know, around their space, they can sort of see, but if they knock you, you know, the joke is if you're in a factory, either the robot or the operator has to be in a cage. So somebody doesn't, you know, the person doesn't get hurt. But, you know, we have these soft robots that are actually, you know, kind of made of nylon actuated by air. Like think of Baymax in, uh, in the, what is that Disney movie, Big Hero 6, right? So now robots can work side by side with people, or you can actually maybe strap these things on and they can, they can be kind of human augmentation. Some of the things we're seeing going on in AI that allow us to kind of process the world around us much faster and, and, and much more kind of in a real time way. There's so much amazing stuff going on that portends this really you know interesting future people 
in Silicon Valley talk about the future of plenty, where scarcity is is gone. Things that were 10 years ago unobtainium are today, you know, kind of commonplace. And you've got these parts libraries and open source hardware and all this stuff. Like it's, you know, robot operating system, the ROS, right? That's open source. It's amazing what's going on, right? And so one thing that somebody said to me is they said, and this is Albert at Union Square, he wrote a great book and he talks about how on the internet, you know, content is free, information is free, and the marginal cost of delivering it is zero. What if we could, you know, make the marginal cost of delivering food zero, right? Now, it'll never be that because there's still some fixed cost, but what if we could bring that way down? Like, you know, right now we have all kinds of issues, both economic, but as well as kind of sociological issues related to picking food, right? Like, so, you know, immigration, like that's a big, you know, challenge. Well, we've got food rope, you know, we have portfolio companies that are berry pickers, like they're these robots that that can tell, you know, optimum ripeness, etc, and pick berries. That's really, really crazy. That starts to change the economics, right? And people, you know, we in the future, hopefully, we won't have scarcity, we'll just have maldistribution. And that's kind of the Silicon Valley, you know, mentality that I love. There's a problem, let's solve it. So let's turn a little bit to portfolio construction. So today, you manage a venture fund of funds. And so endowments, foundations will entrust you with capital, and you are going to find different venture firms. If you're a tech bug, you could easily drift, especially in the Valley, to just investing in kind of the same types of of firms or maybe the same types of companies. How do you think about portfolio construction? How much does it matter when you're investing in venture capital, or is it just the chase of great ideas? (laughs) That's a really interesting question to which my answer has changed radically even in the last, you know, day and a half. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I'm kind of constantly cognizant of this question of, you know, Buffett's equation, you know, opportunity equals value minus perception. And I I tend to get really skeptical of, you know, areas that are overfunded. And as a result, you know, you could very easily build a portfolio. If you went and invested in kind of the top 10 brand name funds, you'd have a lot of the same kinds of deals. Now, they're all, they're clever folks and they they know how to make money. So you, you might kind of get the best in class. But I'm looking for kind of different things right now because I want to hit them where they ain't. I've got like a hypothesis going as, you know, is there money to be made in material science, right? Are there other ways in which we can actually get venture returns by funding innovation and in non-fund structures? I'm trying to be like quirky and different. Now, here's the here's where I vacillate madly. I'm a huge advocate of concentration. I believe that concentrated portfolios, if you're a little inside baseball, with, and this is, I think, generally true about portfolio construction, like... People kind of vacillate between kind of optionality and, you know, kind of diversification, optionality and diversification on one side versus kind of conviction on the other, right? And people always ask us, like, at Princeton, did we use sizing as a proxy? And I don't remember what answer Andy gave, but the answer I invented in my own head that I continue to ascribe to Andy, so I apologies if I've got it wrong, is like, we shouldn't pick and choose among our managers once we decide to hire them, the bar is so high that we should hit them hard. We shouldn't take these like little, you know, hesitation marks, right? Like I know a lot of people are like, oh, I'll throw a million dollars in that and see how it goes. That's, you're not diversifying when you do that, you're diversifying. And so that, you know, that led me like in my, in the fund that I spend most of my time on, my top four managers are 80% of the dollars. There are a bunch of reasons why you might do that, right? One is that your clients have other investments, and so the concentration you take gets diversified away in their portfolio. It's a different question if you said, hey, this is just your money. Would you make the same allocation then, or would you spread it out a little thinner? Or would you say, no, I'm going to be concentrated within venture, but I'll diversify outside of venture? You know, so that it's a fair question. You know, just, just for perspective, in those four managers, you know, on average, each of those managers will have 40 to 50 companies. We'll have several hundred companies. You know, there'll be some duplication because they'll be, you know, they'll co-invest with each other. But I've got a lot of company exposure. That said, you know, my own personal money, I've got a lot of my net worth levered to innovation. My not just my investments in my own funds, but my real estate in Palo Alto. Right. In fact, <laughs> if I could do anything, you know what I might buy? I might buy some timber. <laughs> Let me tell you why Timber's awesome. I'm just kidding. <laughs> How do you think about pricing? I mean, it's a little bit different because you're investing in funds. You, know, you talked a little bit about what happens when funds have success and they charge more. 
as you're talking to the venture capitalists that you invest with, how much do, do, is pricing just a function of the supply of capital chasing venture opportunities? And how discerning you know, can a venture capitalist be? I think in the main, most venture capitalists today are price takers, not price makers. Bill Hellman from Greylock said to me a long, long time ago, he said, you know, we don't feel like there's much of a charm premium left anymore. We, you know, by, you know, with our winning smiles, we can't get, even being one of the best firms, we can't really get great discounts. Sometimes entrepreneurs will take discounts to be in deals, but there's such fear of missing out. You know, FOMO is really driving the market. And by the way, the pendulum of power is really swung toward the entrepreneur. And, you know, the higher a price they get, the less dilution they take. So the pricing environment is really quite tough to my great dismay. It tends to be more rational in the very early stage because risk tends to be so high and these companies aren't fully formed and don't have as much proof of concept or product market fit, you know, validation, what have you. And so, you know, traction, people are paying crazy prices for tra- when something gets traction, right? And I think part of the problem is that the end buyers, i.e. the acquirers or public markets, haven't you know been as forceful with in- enforcing price discipline. And so you have this inversion where like public com- private companies are worth much more than they'd be worth in the public markets. Some days I look at my portfolio and the successful companies where we've got nice markups, but like the later stage investors who've come in have paid higher prices. That sometimes looks like the S&P mid-cap 400. People look at Silicon Valley like, oh my gosh, why are all these startups so so richly valued and why are kind of Fidelity and Wellington, all these hedge funds playing in Silicon Valley. It's such a head scratcher and people think it's a momentum play. I actually think it's a reflection of a deeper market reality. There's this great article that the accountants at Grant Thornton wrote about 10 years ago, which was really formative to me. The phrase was the great delisting machine. And they talked about the market structure changes. So, you know, kind of decimalization and lack of research and all this stuff was fundamentally changing market structure in ways that made it harder for small caps to go public. So the whole emerging growth market that brought us, you know, Apple and Microsoft and all that is gone today, right? These companies need to be $100 million in revenue with three quarters of, you know, growing or shrinking losses or growing, whatever. There's a whole kind of rubric now that's much different than it was in the old days. And as a result, there's this, the whole bottom decile of the market is gone, right? So it makes sense. And historically, the Ibbotson data would show that that was some, where some of the best returns were. So if your whole micro cap public market is gone, where are you going to go for emerging growth companies? So it makes perfect sense for Fidelity and T. Rowe and all these guys to come in. The question is, how do you get liquid? How do you put the moolah in the kula? Right, like because the moolah in the kula, the moolah in the kula, because nothing counts. At the end of the day, you know, we can have these markups and and kind of flout, you know, great quote unquote performance, but until the money comes back, it's just yeah. not. So I, I'm really fascinated by the current market structure. I'd love to talk a little more about that. Uh, Mike Mobison said something not too long ago that if you looked back ten or fifteen years ago and you wanted to get exposure to the U.S. economy, you would invest in the S&P 500 and you invest in venture capital. Mm -hmm. And that was early stage and you kind of cover everything. Whereas today, the number of public companies, as you said, whether it's the bottom decile, has just shrunk. And there's a void between early stage and now you have these later stage still private companies. And there's a notion that the private market companies, particularly in later rounds, are rich, maybe richer than what the public, you know, that might be a down round to go into the public market. We've seen a version of this before that didn't end well in the early knots. If you fast forward five years from now, what are the two or three different outcomes that we, we that you think we might see a few years down the road? I think one thing that's really critical is that the venture ecosystem continues to produce companies that fundamentally change the world, right? That's almost cliche where I'm from. But if you look at it today, you know, the largest transportation company in the world, Uber, you know, doesn't own any transportation assets. The largest, you know, lodging company, Airbnb, by some metrics, owns no real estate, right? The the largest retailers own no inventory, right? This is actually a world change. And some of these companies are are private. Now the question becomes, you know, what are the, you know, what are the valuations? We've I think over perceived this stuff. The reality of it is and, and you ask an interesting question because you say, you know, what conversation are we having two to three years from now? I think 
I'm going to take the easy way out and I'll say, the que- what's the conversation we're having 10 years from now? Conversation we're having 10 years from now is the same as we were in 99, which is when John Doerr said, in the short term, the internet is overhyped and in the long term, it's underhyped. Right? And I think, we've, I think we're at that moment where we're overhyped in some areas, but underhyped in the long term. Right? And I look at areas like you know, robotics and you know, AI and stuff that are you know, really hyped up now, but like, long term will be fundamentally life altering innovations. The question is in the short term, does it, you know, do both venture capitalists, acquirers, and public markets allocate that capital? appropriately. I often talk to entrepreneurs and say, you know, once you take venture capital, the venture capitalist business model is your business model. You've got to get liquid at a number that makes sense for them. And entrepreneurs love vanity valuations, right? They love having the billion dollar company makes, you know, makes them feel good, makes them, they have something to talk about at the battery or what have you. High valuations are good because you take less dilution, et cetera. But the reality is when you have a high valuation, it starts to limit your options. And I think we're starting to see companies that were highly valued that had a moment where they could have been acquired or gone public if they were you know, less richly valued, but that moment's passed, and now either the company is kind of plateaued or they've got a disruptor themselves. You know, the disruptors are going to get disrupted. And I think that's going to be – that's like – the sad story for me that I'm worried about kind of two to three years out, like we had companies A, B, C, and D that were great businesses that could have really done something, but their valuation really tripped them, you know, tripped them up. And and that's a self-inflicted wound. I'm really curious about how you spend your day Mm. because we talked a little bit about sourcing, being in the Valley, going to college campuses, whatever it is to find ideas. We talked a little bit about, um, the diligence process and talking to entrepreneurs. How do you how do you monitor your portfolio once once you've made these commitments? These commitments are ten years long or longer. Yeah, you now are in long term relationships, some of which go great, some of which don't. Yeah, you know it's funny. It, it takes a lot of patience to invest in venture capital funds because the average venture partnership lasts twice as long as the average American marriage. Isn't that crazy? Average venture fund goes ten years plus. You know, kind of. Three, four, five, one-year extensions. You know that kind of that has some implications for partnership dynamics. So you've got to be on top of like what what's going on inside the funds, and you know are are there are there tensions? It's it's this like microcosm of like organizational you know behavioral dynamics, and then you got to understand you know kind of what they're doing in the portfolio and how they're adding value and what you know how the companies are progressing and, and and what have you. So in a typical day, you know, it's funny if I were to look at, you know, an average week, I'll take an average week because there's, you know, it'll be lumpy, but in an average week, the kind of classic day, I'll have a meeting with an existing manager to talk about their portfolio, try to understand what's going well, what's going poorly. I'll make some mental notes about, you know, where can I cross reference, you know, the things they're saying to see if they're, you know, kind of full of it or if they're actually being authentic and clear eyed. Very often, I'll have investors come through. Probably like two or three days a week, I'll have an inv- either existing or potential investor come through, and I do this great Palo Alto wor- walking tour, which is like a tour. There's some great stops on it. I was a tour guide in college, so I can do the 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 storytelling and walking backwards and and what have you. But you know, the history of Palo Alto is very much the history of the American electronics industry. And so there's some great stuff. So we'll, you know, that'll be an hour and a half. I'll meet an entrepreneur to talk about their business and understand their venture capitalists. I'll hopefully have had you know kind of a, a neuron fire from a conversation three days earlier with a venture capitalist that invested in the company that you know to kind of triangulate how they're doing. That's basically what I do. And then I'll drive up to San Francisco to my favorite robotics lab and go see what's going on with with one of my favorite robotics companies and then I'll drive down to San Jose and and see what's going on in AI it's it's just like being out there like I don't actually sit still and part of it is because I have ADD <laughs> um, but uh, but mostly I just can't sit still so when you synthesize all these meetings all these communications with people across the food chain of venture capital at some point in time you then have to make a decision yeah so there's a, a fund that's coming back you know, fund 3 was great but now it's fund 4 yeah what are the kind of critical factors that ultimately go into that decision of whether you're going to back either a new fund or the next round of a fund you've been with? Yep. Well, to simplify it, I need to understand the people. I need to understand, are they distinctive, outstanding? You know, How is it that they have a competitive advantage that's somewhat durable? Understanding that that's a wasting asset. 
understanding the strategy. So the strategy has to pass my smell test, but also needs to be interesting and additive. And importantly, there needs to be a resonance between the people and the strategy. Out of the people and the strategy fall their portfolio. And the portfolio is it's the people and strategy in action, the proof of the puddings and the tasting. So that's where I spend time with entrepreneurs and kind of that helps me, that gives me a window into kind of how these people behave. And is, are your preferences for a venture capitalist that has kind of the right network of companies and the ecosystem to help uh, an entrepreneur build their team? Or is it more their insight once a company's launched to know strategically what markets to go to and, and how to make changes on the fly? So one of the you know, great venture capitalists ultimately are great conciliaries. They've seen everything that can help. You know, but you know, one conclusion I came to is that you know, no person has a monopoly on wisdom. And so kind of in 05, 06, I was spending a lot of time with Josh Koppelman at First Round, and he was articulating his vision for what he called the First Round platform. Like, how do you help a venture firm punch above its weight? And so, you know, rather than the venture capitalist being the hub in the middle of this kind of hub and spoke network, could you push, you know, he called it the Napster of venture, right? Could you push the interactions out to the frontier where entrepreneurs are interacting with each other and the venture capitalist is removed as the, the bottleneck? And in fact, you know, what I want to go on my tombstone is I said to Josh, and, and this is now kind of posterized in, in first round's offices, uh, there are three offices around the country, I said, you know, what you're really talking about is you're talking about portfolio as community, right? And that became kind of Josh's watchword for a while, portfolio as community. So how do you build a community around um, around what you're doing so that the resources available to each entrepreneur are greater than those of the, the, the venture capitalists themselves? And that was a real animator for my for my investing for a long time. Now, it caused me to miss some people because there's some great Lone Rangers out there, right? But I look at First Round True, Data Collective, these guys that kind of form the backbone of my portfolio, and those guys are, all bring resources kind of greater than themselves to, to, to bear. I want to talk a little bit about fees. Mm. Um, now, we've gone through this sea change in the public markets where if you looked at the returns from the last 10 years compared to the 10 years before that, particularly in the hedge fund world, what used to be a low, mid, double-digit net return became a mid, single-digit net return, and the, and the fee structure didn't evolve. Yeah. And as a result of that, the fees that hedge fund managers charged you know, 10 years ago, and then for the most part still charged today, are just too high as a percentage of what's being delivered. You look at venture capital, and we've, we've started to see it. You could look at Yale's numbers from the last 10 years compared to the 10 years before you had astronomically high returns, which meant that, as you said, as, as long as there's demand for the right venture funds, they can charge more and more. Uh, as a fund of funds, there's a layer of fees. But we also are in an environment where things might be a little more expensive. And again, as long as the total net returns are high enough, there's a big pie and everyone can eat from that pie. Is there much discussion in the venture world today about fees? Or are people still more concerned with access that they're willing to pay that they, they, the investors in venture capital funds, are price takers and not price makers. It's it's very much, despite you know my raging against my shouts into the into the wind. You know we're still very much price takers. Now there's some groups that are kind of pushing groups like ILPA, but they tend to push on on the larger funds. You know the the, the black zones, the people that tend to take a lot of money from the the state plans. But in venture world, you tend not to see much pushback. In fact, what you're seeing is a lot of people are now kind of going to hire carries after hurdles. So there'll be a 20 carry up to a two and a half or three X, and then it'll kick up to a 30 carry. And I fought that for a while. And, and it, you know, it's, it's sort of become market. And the reality of it is, if somebody can deliver me a three X fund, I'm glad to. So then the discussion becomes around, okay, well, what are the catch ups and, and, and what have you. So the just, you know, I try to, you know, they've already breached the line. Now I'm just trying to make sure that, that we get our wounded away. Um, but like at the same time, like uh, uh, one example that was really instructive to me was we got, when I was at Princeton, that Sequoia raised a fund in 2003 and they sent docs around and we were very diligent. We sent our docs out to our law firm and they came back with like three pages of comments and, and we sent them to Sequoia and we got a call from the lawyer and he just said, I just want you to know the documents are as is. So for the top firms, and you're kind of going back to something I said before, if you put 50 LPs in a room, you know, there'd be, f and ask them to list their top 10 firms, there'd be four or five that were kind of acclimated to this as the top, but the list would probably encompass 40 or 50 firms, right? Because everybody's got their own favorites. And 
a lot of those funds can, you know, because they're oversubscribed, they, they, can, they can set the price. I want to turn to writing. Uh, you are the Super LP. You have a blog called Super LP, uh, some of which has just been fantastic to read over the years. Thank you. And I'm curious, why do you write the blog? And what, you know, what purpose does it serve uh, for you and, and for your investors? You know, it's funny, and I have to say beforehand, you know, it's called Super LP not because I have any aggrandized vision of myself, but rather because I was once in London and I underpacked and I went to a meeting and I rewore my suit and the shirt, but I, I was gentlemanly enough to change my undershirt and I was out of white t-shirts. And so I had this red t-shirt that I was going to work out in. And, and I went to this meeting and I had the top button open. I didn't have a tie on and somebody saw my red shirt underneath and they said, what are, what are those? Your super LP underoos? And I said, oh. <laughs> and a nickname was, was born. So, uh, you know, it's funny, you know, blogging as you'll recall was huge in like, Oh five, Oh six, Oh seven, you know, it was really on the front end in Oh five, but like by Oh seven, Oh eight was huge. And so uh, I was talking to Josh Koppelman and he was like, you know, you've got a lot of interesting stuff to say. He's like, but importantly, like there's a lot of people saying stuff and he's like, you're not any smarter than the next guy. Thanks, Josh. He goes, but you're at least 20% funnier. So if you can capture that voice in your writing, he's like, you'll get an audience. And I thought, you know, I did have something to say because there weren't any people in the LP world blogging because it's a very kind of quiet business because nobody wants to say anything you know dangerous or controversial so i thought you know i can be edgy but not scary i can talk about different issues and i can educate people because i was hearing from a lot of people a lot of people had come into the business in 0102 kind of following swenson's book a lot of people had kind of built out their teams and so there were a lot of people coming in and I, it was a way for me to kind of mentor the next generation and so I really had a lot of fun doing it. I, I started doing it a little bit less just because it's a little bit time consuming. But every now and again, the spirit moves me. I try to kind of capture that voice and that spirit and, and really kind of, you know, educate and cajole and, and inform. And it's, it's a lot of fun and it builds great kind of community and engagement. Great. So a few closing questions for a little bit of fun. What advice would you give someone early in their career? Railroads. well you know so this is the advice actually that i'd give you know most people are so animated by career risk and you know if you i I was a consultant so everything's a two by two matrix and if on one axis you have you know kind of being wrong or right good decisions sometimes have bad outcomes right you're sometimes unlucky so there that's a distribution so you will sometimes be wrong acknowledge that and then on the other axis you, you you can be with the crowd or you can be alone right and so many people are afraid of being wrong and alone right this is what david salem really reinforced me they're so afraid of being wrong and alone and taking that career risk that they migrate from being alone and having conviction to being with the crowd but when you migrate towards the crowd side you take the right and alone box out of play and that's where fortune and glory reside. And if you can be right and alone, that's where you can, you know, kind of invest courageously, invest heroically. So I would, that's the bit of advice I'd give people is think about your special advantages and how you can be courageous. What is your favorite thing to do that is a complete waste of time? <laughs> well, waste of time is all relative I will say the thing that takes up a lot of time, because I don't want to call it a waste. Um, I coach Little League, which is, as we say in California, hella fun. And particularly, I pitch batting practice. I think I'm going to be the first first Little League coach ever to require Tommy John surgery. <laughs> but it's like this great, like here I am, I'm like all stressed out about company X that's flailing or, you know, company B that's getting traction, but, you know, is going to get overpriced the next round or, or the fact that, you know, we're going to bow before our robot overlords in 10 years and will we have universal basic income and, you know, how are people going to live? I, who even knows? And, you know, I get to throw strikes. And that just clears the mind like nothing else. Well, Chris, I'm, I'm glad your pitching's improved because, uh, you know, we don't need to circle back to what happened with your hitting <laughs> on a key moment. <laughs> All right. What phrase did your mother or father repeat over and over that most stuck with you? You know, my dad always said something. My dad's a, a taxi driver and he, you know, he lived a, a hard scrabble life and, and, you know, kind of understood interpersonal dynamics as well as a lot of people I knew. And he said, he said, my son, in life, somebody always has you by the balls. All you can control is how hard they squeeze. And I'd sit there and go, wow. You know, and I think about that a lot. It actually helps me understand kind of 
why people do certain things and understanding what people's incentives are. You know, uh, you know, in New Haven, they, you know, economics class might have, you know, given us, uh, you know, kind of more fancy Ivy League lingo for that. But it's, it's a really important insight. That's great. What was your favorite sports moment as a participant or as a fan? I'm going to give two answers to that question. My first answer is actually being a spectator at a ball game of my son's. So here, here's my son. He's a great ball player, but he doesn't look like a ball player. I'm like, I don't know how many times I have to ask him to tuck his shirt in or tie his shoes or, or what have you. And he's standing at home plate in a tight game, you know, runners on first and third. And this mom was just saying to me, she's like, could you ask your son to tuck his shirt in, please? And on the very next pitch, he had a double in the gap to to knock in two runs. <laughs> Vindication. Yeah, Billy Bean was watching. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what's yeah? So my favorite moment as a spectator was the Aaron Boone home run to beat the Red oh, Sox. Yeah. So my good friend Pete Kingston, who's now at Prime Cap Management, he's a great guy, really smart guy. He worked with me at Princeton. His brother at the time worked for the Padres, and so we got some awesome seats on a lark. Like we just went into this game, and we were in the upper deck. And I just remember Wakefield threw the pitch, and Boone hit it. But because of where we were, we were in the third base side and in left field, about halfway halfway up the left field line. Because of where the ball was hit, we lost sight of it because it came flying out on arc, and it was clear that if the ball was fair, it was a home run. And we saw the white ball arcing high against the dark night until we, you know, it kind of hit, hit its apogee and hung there just for a second, like the moon in the distance, and, and, you know, kind of paused almost as if to tantalize us, and then started falling in, in, in this kind of low, graceful descent. And then it fell first below the, you know, the, the kind of line of the people who were all standing to see it land, and then kind of below the, the deck. And I didn't know if it was gone. And so I looked over to right field instinctively to see how their reaction was, the people in the stands. And everybody started jumping up and down. And so we started jumping up and down. And I looked to see Boone trotting around the bases. And it was, I've never been, I'd been at, you know, kind of Mariano Rivera closing out World Series games, you know, ALCS games. The sheer exaltation, you know, 55,000 people cheering as one. It was like a religious experience. I cried. That's awesome. It was unbelievable. I remember where I was in that moment. Oh, my gosh. 2003. It was unbelievable. So if you could start over today, Mm -hmm. money was no object, and you couldn't be an investor, Mm. what would you like to do? Wow. You know, there's the obvious answer, which is I'd love to be a ball player. But but, alas, talent and genetics and and (laughs) lack of inclination to bust my ass that hard, uh, all conspire against me. <laughs> what do you know now that you wish you knew 10 years ago? You know, I'm very aggro. I, th- I need things to happen yesterday. And my mom always would say things like, this too shall pass, or everything kind of works out in the end. And I didn't believe that 10 years ago. And now maybe this is what we call wisdom here in the summer of my 45th year. I've actually come to believe that things actually like work out and whether that's, you know, all of our cognitive biases and, and what have you, like there was a lot of stuff that I used to really stress about. And if, you know, what's that old cliche, don't sweat the small stuff and it's all small stuff. Right. And I feel like much more at peace today, which is tough in the Bay area, which is an always on, you know, hundred miles an hour, you know, FOMO, ridden environment it's important to kind of find that that piece i'm not there i'm thinking about taking up mindfulness and this and that uh, you know there's an app for that i think there's an app for that exactly exactly but that's it uh last one it's your waning days you are 90 years old sitting in a rocking chair you've already had six shoulder surgeries what advice would you give yourself today you know again this one might be a little bit cliche but I really think that we don't make enough time for the people that are important to us. And so my New Year's resolution this year was I, I actually like made a spreadsheet. This is like so over-engineered. I made a spreadsheet. I downloaded all my, all my friends from Facebook and looked through my contacts and thought about people I knew in college and high school and Brooklyn and all, all the stops I've had 
TIFF and Princeton, wherever, and made a list of people. I actually spent like a whole day on this. And I like put people in buckets. Like this is sad. There was a group of people I wanted to talk to like once a week. There's a group of people, and it, was, it was, wasn't a lot of people. A group of people that I wanted to talk to once a month, a group of people I wanted to talk to once a quarter. And like I was like, every day I'm going to make a phone call. That lasted like three days. <laughs> That's New Year's resolution. <laughs> but at least now I have the spreadsheet. And so there are a lot of people out there who should be expecting calls. But it's great. Like the people I call, like I called my best man. I hadn't talked to my best man. I love him madly. We're like, we're like brothers. I hadn't talked to him in like a year and a half. And I called him up. We had an amazing conversation. The reason I stopped is you end up talking like an hour, hour and a half. Like it's just go, go. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, I, 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 you know, the, the reality of the day intrudes. And that's kind of sad. Yeah, yeah. Chris, this is a total blast. Oh my gosh, always Thanks for blast. making the time. I'm glad I got to finally apologize for that, that fly out after 26 years. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. There's always <laughs> another game. Uh, always another game. There's our lesson. All right, my friend. Great to see you. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you've liked what you've heard, please write a review on iTunes or Google Play to help others find out about the show. Have a good one and see you next time. Next time.